Hey everyone, welcome to the Chapel's online campus. My name is John Dara. Thank you all so much for being here today. We're gonna get started in just a little bit with some awesome worship music and a really great message. Also, if you click on the notes tab in your chat, you'll see some really helpful links for different things going on at the chapel. So hope you guys enjoy the service and I'll see you in the chat. Good morning and welcome to the chapel. My name is Lauren and we are so excited to have you here with us today. I pray that this service would bless you and you would feel the Lord's joy. he lives. Let's sing together. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died. My 
words because I know he holds the future life is worth living because he lives those are beautiful words before we pray together this morning I just want to remind you that this is Memorial Day weekend where we remember those that gave their lives for our country and we just want to take a moment during our prayer to just recognize the families that are represented and to thank them for their sacrifice for us let's pray together Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to be here, listening, singing, praising, praying to the Lord who lives. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you have done for us. And we thank you that because you are alive, life is worth the living. Lord, in this Memorial Day weekend, we just want to remind ourselves of those that gave their lives for this country, for the freedoms and for the joys that we are able to appreciate here in this country. And we just thank you for their service and for their sacrifice during this time. We pray for the families that they represent, that you would be with them and comfort them as they think about these things this weekend. Lord, we ask your blessing now as we continue to praise you and worship you and to learn more about you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This has been a really tough week for me. I think this whole thing is starting to really get to me. I'm not going to lie. Um, I haven't gotten enough vitamin D either. I think that's another part of the reason. Uh, and we were chatting a little bit earlier that it's really easy to get your spirits down. And I'm so thankful for Pastor Dave preaching that sermon a couple of weeks ago about grieving and venting and eventually being able to praise. praise. And I'm just reminded by, the, by what the psalmist said in that psalm. Lord, I will praise you because you have done good things for me. And it's a reminder that through all of this turmoil and all these trials, 
that we are blessed to know the Lord Jesus. Let's sing together. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship your holy sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing.
sing like never before oh my soul i worship your holy name yes i worship your holy name lord i worship your Hi, I'm Ted Boltmer, one of the pastors here at the chapel. Thank you for joining us today. I'm glad you're here. If this is your first time with us, please take a minute to complete the online connect card so we can get to know you a bit more. If you have any questions about our church or today's service, just let John Dara know. He's our online campus pastor, and you can chat with him right now if you like. Tomorrow's Memorial Day, where we pause to honor the men and women who died while serving our country. So if you've lost a family member or a loved one who gave their life in service in our armed forces, we want to just recognize you and thank you for your sacrifice. And you know, in this Memorial Day during a pandemic, our thoughts and prayers go out to all the nurses and doctors and healthcare workers, all the frontline workers who are doing so much for each one of us. Thank you for all you're doing now. This is the time in our service where we pray for the offering. But before I do that, I want to thank all of you for your generosity and support during this time. I know these are challenging times financially for many of you, but because of your gifts, many of our ministries are continuing online. So thank you for that. And as you've heard me say before, if there's anything we can do for any one of you, just reach out and let us know. Let me pray for today's offering. Father God in heaven, I just thank you for your church. I thank you for the technology that allows us to meet even while we're all apart. I wanna thank you for the gifts that you continue to give to the chapel. I just pray that as always, we would be good stewards and that you would multiply these gifts so that we can continue the ministries that are so important to your people. Father, on this Memorial Day, I just wanna remember those who have sacrificed their lives and I pray for their families that they would just feel your love and comfort during these times. In your son's name we pray, amen. Pastor Dave will be back next week to continue the Lockdown Lesson Series, but today we're excited to have Corey Daniels with us. Corey is our Director of Student Ministries here at the chapel. He joined our staff last fall and he'll be preaching today from the book of James. I really enjoyed getting to know Corey and I'm looking forward to his message today. Corey and his wife, Leah, have a one-year-old daughter, Violet May, and we're glad that they're part of the Chapel family. Now here's Samantha with today's announcements, and then we'll hear from Corey. I'm Samantha and welcome to the chapel. While managing through this pandemic has been challenging for all of us, we're not gonna let it stop us from having some of our favorite spring and summer events. So mark your calendars for June 20th for our very own virtual chapel 5K. This is for the whole chapel family and your friends. It's something that we can do together while being apart. So get ready to run, jog, walk, bike, or even just hop on your treadmill and have some fun. So head over to the events tab of our website. There you'll find our virtual 5K hub where you can register and find out more about the races and you can order your very own virtual 5K t-shirt. This year, our 5K will be raising money for the Lincoln Park EMS. Part of the proceeds from the t-shirts will go directly to the EMS to buy new stretchers. So make sure to order your shirt today because the link closes on June 1st. We know that this summer is gonna feel different, but know that our Chapel Kids and Student Ministries are here for you. So join us for our very own Chapel Kids Camp at Home and Chapel Students Lockdown Games the week of July 13th through the 17th. This week's gonna be packed with fun games, activities, and lessons that you'll love. So make sure to sign up your kids and students today. Thanks again for joining us today online. We wanna take a couple minutes and honor the 2020 graduating class of Chapel students. Check this out.
I'm incredibly grateful for all of the amazing friendships that I've made and just all the experiences that have allowed me to deepen my relationship with Jesus. Something I learned from the chapel is how important it is to surround ourselves with people who aren't afraid to express how much they love God. Just like all of my incredible friends I've made from attending. Thank you to the chapel for providing an amazing community to worship and love God. I learned a lot of uh, leadership skills that I am um, very, that I that I use very much uh, today. One big takeaway I have from attending the chapel is that it's really important to be involved because through this I've made so many lifelong friendships and for that I'll be forever thankful. And I'm very thankful for the chapel for bringing me and my friends together because I know it will last a lifetime. I'm so thankful for all the great experiences I've had the chapel to grow in my faith and form lifelong friendships. One takeaway I got from chapel is to always be grateful for what you have. And one thing I got from chapel students was the overwhelming sense of community and the second family that I can never replace. My biggest takeaway from the chapel is the best group of friends I could ever ask for, an amazing small group. Through the chapel, I learned how to serve within the church by being on the tech team for four years since I was a freshman. I'm so grateful for everything the chapel has given me. It has truly become my second home where I have grown in my walk with Jesus alongside my incredibly supportive leaders and friends. So thank you and God bless. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're actually going to take a one-week break from our lockdown lesson series. Uh, several months ago, Pastor Dave actually walked into my office and asked if I wanted to preach. And I said yes, because you're supposed to say yes when the big boss comes in and asks you to do something. Um, and in that moment, actually, there were some nerves and anxiety. I'm being completely honest with you. They just kind of grew exponentially over the last couple months. Uh, but of the one date that I saw on that list, it was this Sunday, this Memorial Day weekend. And I said, you know what? I'll go with that one because I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and assume that most of you are down the shore. Most of you are taking advantage of the long weekend going to see family. That's actually what I was planning on doing. And so I thought that there would be a lot less people here. And then when this pandemic hit, all of a sudden we went online. It became the norm to watch online. And it's very likely that the crowd is just as large, if not larger, than a typical Sunday. Isn't it wonderful how God works sometimes in the most ironic and humorous of ways? But I have a message, and I'm thankful that I can be here, that I think really applies to our current circumstances. I think that we can really relate to. I will admit it, it is a little cliche. It's been maybe worn out in some ways, but um, it works for us in this time in the season especially. And so I just want to shout out to the skeptics, to the critics, to the cynics, any of you who are like kind of tired of this. And I also want to call it out, if you're like me and you're just tired of the same church answers over and over again, I hear you, I see you, and we're going to work through this together. So this morning, let's look at James chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom... You should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, 
coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all that he created. Oftentimes, the hardest thing to overcome isn't necessarily the hardship itself, but it's this loss of control, right? Maybe, maybe the tension in the unknown. And we're not receiving in this passage a gentle memo on how to navigate these trials. In fact, this letter from James, it just starts from zero to 60. Let's call it out. There's little known context or information for us to gather as we start this passage. And I just want to bring you in. Rule number one, I researched this. It says, in communicating a message to others, that your leading point should actually draw them in, not confuse them. And on the surface, James's pickup line seems just so completely, frustratingly ridiculous and confusing. He essentially says, when life gets hard, ready? You should just be joyful. Maybe it's just me. So if it is, I'm just preaching to myself and you can just follow along. But maybe it's just me. But when life gets hard, my first response is like, nah, no, 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 I'm good. I'm going to sidestep it. I'm going to avoid it at all costs. I'll be joyful when it's over. (laughs) And we often tell ourselves, in some ways, you know, we're almost bartering. We're saying, listen, something good must happen if I'm going to go through this. But James is telling us that there's joy in the trial because there's so much good to come from going through the trial. There's so much good to be gained from it. So today, let's look at how James answers the obvious question. Why should I choose joy when life gets hard? And he says it's because it produces these three powerful things in us. The first is perseverance. The second is wisdom. And the third is perspective. So first, perseverance. Um, I'm sure you've heard this term, the sweet smell of success, right? I, I don't know anybody who's ever actually said the rotten smell of success or the musty smell of success or the stale smell of success. Now, success is just straight up sweet, isn't it? We put in, we put in our hard work. We see that hard work pay off right? In the form of, you know, if it's maybe a higher paycheck, maybe it's a career advancement, maybe it's more square footage, maybe it's a new car, maybe it's, you know, some fame, influence, power, any number of those things. Take a look at verse 3 and 4. James says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be Mature and complete, not lacking anything. Essentially what he's telling us is perseverance actually produces something good in us. It makes us, you know, kind of a different kind of a person. Someone who's just more patient maybe. Maybe someone who has endurance to overcome. A refusal to quit. Have you ever noticed that somebody who perseveres, they have a kind of tenacity about them. They carry themselves in a sort of way. Maybe they beat their chests ever so slightly. But often what we see and what James is telling us is that through perseverance, we see that the result is a deeper faith and devotion. Life is really hard right now. It's, it, it's just straight up hard. But... This is a great opportunity to let God do some of his greatest work in your life. And a great example of perseverance through trials is actually in, in one of my favorite points, points in our uh, American history. It's the case of Apollo 13. If you know what I'm talking about, that's great. If you don't, go watch the movie. It's totally worth it. But astronauts Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swaggart persevered. And it wasn't by accident. See, Jim Lovell went to the Naval Academy. He became a Navy pilot. Fred Hayes became a Marine Corps pilot. And Jack Swaggart, after he graduated from college, he went into the Air Force. So all three men, they were educated. All right. They went through basic. They went through military flight school. 
they served their country honorably, and then they applied and they were accepted into the NASA program, which by the way, I found out when I was eight years old, is kind of a big deal and really hard to do. You can't just submit a form and it happens. So this was a really big deal that they underwent all of this. And then just to get chosen for the, the Apollo missions, they actually underwent immense psychological testing. They were tested, they, were, they went through trials, they persevered through all of that. So when they were about a third of the way from the earth to the moon, and the minor defect caused a massive explosion in their oxygen tank, see, they couldn't just sidestep the problem like some of us would want to. They couldn't avoid it. They were literally venting their oxygen supply into space. Um, you know, they had to persevere. And prior to this Apollo 13 mission, all three men actually spent a minimum of 400 hours in the flight simulator preparing for all kinds of just in space flight, moon landing procedures and contingencies, which by the way, when this explosion happened, every one of those contingencies and procedures basically went out the window with their oxygen supply. But they were put in the position to persevere because of the years of testing because of the years of perseverance that led them to that point. Spoiler alert, they make it home safe. But we can take this example and we can see that we have a great opportunity in front of us to persevere through this pandemic, through financial uncertainty, through just incredible emotional pain, maybe through the loss of a loved one, or maybe all of that combined, maybe it's shaking your faith in ways that you honestly didn't think were possible in February. But if you allow God to grant you some supernatural patience to work in you during this pandemic, then just think of the, the deep well from which you can draw just buckets of perseverance for future trials. Maybe those future trials, they look like going back to school to finish your undergrad. Or maybe it's your advanced degree. Maybe, maybe you have this dream of going and becoming a master or a doctor of something. Maybe it's a diagnosis in the future. It's chemo treatments that you're going to have to persevere through in the future. Maybe in the future, you're going to become a loving parent to a child with special needs. And you're just going to need endless amounts of patience to persevere through that trial. When you put the address in Google Maps, this might be just a little more real that we can all really connect to, but you put that address in Google Maps and the time to destination reads 45 minutes in red, but deep down in your heart, you know it should only really take about 30 minutes. Whatever the trial is, I think you and I can say that should we persevere, we can look at that trial and we can say, I got this. Come at me, world. I can endure anything because why? Because I went through the pandemic of 2020. But I think also if we're being really honest with ourselves, without this thing called perseverance, uh, when faced with a hardship, it can be really, really easy to shift the blame onto somebody else and say, you know what, God, this is obviously your fault. Look what James says in verse 13. He says, when tempted or when faced with a trial, no one should say God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their, by their own evil desire and enticed. Think about it like this. Are you and I, are we too focused on just wishing away this trial rather than actually persevering through it? Or in other words, are you maybe a little bit like me, that when this whole pandemic started, I just wanted it to be over as soon as possible. I didn't want anything to do with it. I wanted to go from the beginning to the end as quickly as we could. And I missed this testing of my faith. I missed the opportunity for perseverance for probably the entire month of March, maybe even half the month of April. So forget that perseverance. It was just so easy to just start blaming God for the lack of control, for the hardship, for the trial. And then after the desire has conceived, James continues in verse 15. In other words, after you've bought into this lie that maybe it's God's fault, or you think, you know what, God just wants me to fail through this, then that idea 
it gives birth to sin. That lie, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. So in other words, no matter which way you twist this, if you're not going to persevere, there's no healthy future for you. It's not going to end well. There's no happy ending. James continues in verse 16. He says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Where are my good Christians at? Every good and perfect gift is from above. We've seen this on Instagram and Facebook ad nauseum. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Yeah, verse 17 is the emphasis there. But despite what we might think or feel, that that cliche is actually, it is born in truth. And there is something that we can hold on to. There's a hope there that we can grasp to. So despite this moment, despite the trial, everything good and perfect comes from God. So answer your own question. Why should I choose joy when life gets hard. Because it produces something good in us, in perseverance. The second point is wisdom. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Here we are. James doesn't beat around the bush. He says, if you don't have it, just ask for it. Wise people, they add so much to our lives. They just bring so much to the table. So when we're faced with a difficult decision on something, here's a couple examples. Um, On your future. You know, when when I knew that I wanted to ask Leah to marry me, I went to my parents and I went to wise people and I ran the idea by them first. I didn't make that decision by myself. College plans. Our seniors in the video, they didn't make those decisions by themselves. Those were hard decisions that needed to be made, you know, by, by, career, or by advice from, from, from wise people. Career advice for our college grads and young adults, financial advice, I feel like we all kind of need that right now. But are we going to just go to random people who we don't have any kind of relationship with, who are maybe a little crazy in the way they live their life? Now, let's be honest, we're going to seek out the wise people who know us, who know our life, you know, the people that we've spent time with, the people that we trust, the people who we've shared our life experience with, and we know that they have our best interest in mind. But then also keep in mind that notice James doesn't tell us to ask for knowledge. And I think there is some key differences between wisdom and knowledge as it applies to this finding joy in our trials. Here's a prime example. I'm going to be completely honest with you, just full on. You ready? I gained a a lot of knowledge while in college. I did. I read a lot of books. I did a lot of homework assignments. I had studies in theology and counseling and philosophy and youth studies. But when this pandemic hit, there I was. I was sitting at my desk. I was surrounded by the books that I had read. And I, I can humbly say that I passed those classes, you know, with flying colors. So let's just assume that I retain most of the information. But as I sat there at my desk for a long, heartbreakingly, awkwardly uncomfortable moment, I recognized that not a single one of those books contained the words pandemic, social distancing, quarantine. They didn't even contain church online. And worst of all, they didn't contain toilet paper shortage. All of the knowledge in the world, as great as it can be up here, if you can't move it down to here and apply it to your life and apply it to others and to grow from that, then what good is it? Knowledge can only take us so far. James continues in verse 6. He says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Do you kind of get the sense that maybe James is being really blunt about all this because maybe he struggles with it? 
He's like, if you, you know, if you're going to ask, don't doubt. Don't waste your time. Don't waste God's time. Don't be tossed like the waves on the sea. Don't be inconsistent in your prayers. Don't be shaken by the trial. Don't be double-minded and unstable in all that you do. Rather, when life gets hard, just ask to gain boldly in faith wisdom from that trial. If there's one key difference between knowledge and wisdom, I think it's this, that knowledge is crushed in the presence of doubt, but wisdom thrives on shifting seas. When Satan tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden, you can read about this in Genesis chapter 3. When he showed up, he didn't just give Eve the fruit. He didn't pick it himself. He didn't force feed it to her. He simply planted what? A seed of doubt. He said, did God actually say that you shouldn't eat from there? Did God actually tell you that there would be consequences if you did? And that seed of doubt, it just grew so quickly. And what did they do? They picked the fruit. They bit into it. It was sweet. It was wonderful. It was amazing. And for a second, everything was perfect. But then their eyes were opened. And here's where things got really messy really quick. And here's where they realized that something was wrong. When they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they gained the knowledge that there was the existence of good and evil. But they lacked the wisdom to discern the difference between the two. The fall, the introduction into sin, this separation from God, this is the origin story for the when life gets hard narrative. So ask yourself the question, why choose joy when life gets hard? Because it will make us people of wisdom. And listen, in the days to come, you you and I can be the kind of people that others go to, that others actually seek out because of this hard-won wisdom. And in that, in that relational aspect, we can take joy in just providing guidance to others through their trials. Perseverance, wisdom, and lastly, perspective. This is my favorite one. As far as humanity goes, it's, our, it's kind of our natural brokenness to just fixate on the trial. If only just at first, but we still, we just seem to fixate on the trial right in front of us. It could just be that shocking nature of the unexpected. Going back to, to what I said, it could be a lack of control. Is, is there this tension in the unknown that you're wrestling with? Uh, but James encourages us mainly to just gain a larger perspective. And to illustrate this, he uses the example of wealth and money. Check out verse nine. He says, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the, ch- but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. What a great reminder this is for those of you that are poor. He's, he's just saying, keep your chin up. And if you're wealthy, maybe don't hold on to it so tightly. See, these current circumstances that we're in right now, they're they're a little bit deceptive. We don't really have any control over them. So don't get caught up in your status. Don't don't get caught up in your wealth, financial success. These things, they're just like a wildflower. And the truth is that they may be beautiful and they may be bountiful, but the sun's going to rise with this scorching heat and its beauty's going to get destroyed and you're not going to have any say in the matter. But what does this look like for us, maybe even beyond this wealth conversation? Uh, Think about it if you're somebody who struggles with depression. I understand that this could be incredibly difficult, especially during this time. It can feel in the moment like things may always be like this, and that you just can't overcome this, this constant feeling of hopelessness. If you've been furloughed from work, or if you think maybe in the very near future you will be, it can feel like you might never financially recover. And maybe you just look up and you scream at the sky or you shake your fist and you're like, God, you know, why are you letting this happen? Let's take this small perspective and let's zoom out to see the bigger perspective, the bigger picture, as James encourages us to. 
At one point in our history, there was this thing called the Spanish flu pandemic back in 1918, and we got through it. There was this thing called the Great Depression, and we got through it. We had countless wars, many of which had immense effects on our economy. World War I, World War II, Vietnam, and then we had 9-11 and the wars that were connected to that. And then we had the Great Recession in 2008. And those were all incredibly hard times. I'm not going to just brush those off and say, sure, they were easy. They were really hard times. And, and in some ways, for some of us, we're still kind of trying to recover financially, emotionally, even spiritually from some of these instances in our history. But things did in fact get better, right? Right? Perspective is our ability to see the bigger picture and to move toward it or to remain blind to this bigger picture and find ourselves stuck or worse, moving backwards. You know, I have the privilege of working with our students. And if I can for a moment, since I have the microphone, I'm going to brag on them a little bit. Um, our students are resilient they're really, they're really, really unique. And our, in our senior class especially, I kind of wish that I had more time to spend with them because they have gifts and they have talents. And right now, they're looking beyond these current circumstances. Yes, they lost their proms. They lost graduation parties, senior trips. I don't know if senior skip days are still a thing, but if they are, they lost those too. They lost this traditional commencement ceremony with everything kind of moving to online ceremonies. They lost memories and moments that should have actually lasted a lifetime for them. And really these experiences are designed to help them transition to become young adults. And all of that is gone. But though they're being robbed of some of these present joys, just based on their Instagram posts and Facebook posts, this proves that they aren't going to be robbed of this bigger perspective. They're looking to their future our seniors, even all of our students down through middle schoolers, they have passions and they have a greater vision for where their life is going. I shared rule number one earlier. Rule number two says that when you're communicating a message to others, what you're supposed to do is you end with something a little bit more encouraging. Something to kind of leave everybody wanting more, something that we can all just grasp onto and appreciate. And this actually, James, you know, James gets this one right. Look at verse 12. He says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, having persevered, having gained wisdom, and by looking at this bigger picture, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. In other words, choose joy when life gets hard because it will be worth it in the end. I don't think James is exclusively saying through perseverance you will be saved, but he's reminding those of us who are saved by grace that there is a greater reward in heaven for those who gain these things in life. If you're somebody too who's just kind of struggled to persevere through trial after trial, maybe if you feel like you're just lacking in wisdom in general, or you feel like you have this, this tiny little perspective that's just a little limited in the grand scheme of things, and the result is just wave of hopelessness after wave of hopelessness. I just want to share with you the biggest perspective that I can offer. But first, let's just acknowledge something, the elephant in the room. There's something not quite right with this world. Everybody tweet that right now. I know you've never heard that before. There's just something not quite right with this world. And that's true. But the bigger perspective wipes that out. And the bigger perspective is this, that God loves you so much that he came down in human form to live and then die for not quite right people like you and me. It's love that binds perseverance, wisdom, and perspective together so that when trials come our way, we can say, you know what, with God, I can be joyful through this trial. Someone who I think understood this as well as anyone is a man named Ravi Zacharias. Ravi is widely considered the greatest spiritual thinker, author, and apologist of the 21st century. He, uh, he gave his life to Christ as a young boy in India. 
And then really over the last 50 years or so, he, uh, he's just led others to know Jesus. He reached out to the cynic in me when I was younger. He reached out to the doubters, to the atheists, to the pessimists, to the addicts, to the broken. And his teachings have this, just this profound impact on millions across the globe. But earlier this year, Ravi was blindsided by a cancer diagnosis. Some of you know this. And on Easter Sunday, in the middle of this pandemic, while fighting through chemo, he posted this across social media saying, death is either a full stop or a comma. In the Christian worldview, it is a comma. There is for the Christian both the passing of all things and the abiding in Christ's provision. That's the reality of Easter. That the resurrection makes the difference. Jesus' triumph over death captures my defeat and takes me into his victory. Then on May 7th, he shared this picture as he and his wife Margie celebrated their 48th wedding anniversary. And on May 8th, a day later, the family was told by doctors in Houston that they have essentially done all that they can do. And they, they sent Ravi home to Atlanta to live out his last days in peace. And it was on that day that his daughter Sarah shared these words on behalf of the family as an update on Ravi's declining health. She said, we know that God has purposed and numbered each of our days. And only he knows how many more Ravi will experience on this earth. While we are so full of so many emotions, we are also at peace, resting in the truth that God knows all, sees all, and is sovereign and good. I think of the great, what? The great joy that my dad will have, and I am comforted. How beautiful for a family going through such pain, such uncertainty, unable to solve or fix this current situation, unable to have any control over this hardship, but they place their trust in a sovereign God, and they find rest because they know that there's only joy for Ravi. He no longer needs to cling to that greater perspective to survive here on earth. Because now he's actually celebrating in the presence of God. He's living out that greater perspective. On Tuesday, May 19th, this past Tuesday, Ravi went home. There is joy in the trial because it will be worth it in the end. Now, you may not have the same experience as Ravi or his family, but we do all kind of share this same commonality. The truth is you and I will have trials, and we are, we are so in one right now. So answer your question, why choose joy when life gets hard? Because it produces three powerful things in us. The first is perseverance. The second is wisdom, and the third is perspective. I want to encourage you to rise to your feet as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are in control. We pray this humbly and with just incredible joy. For some of us, this might be the first time that we've dared to let you have a say in our lives. This might be the first time that we've actually turned to face our current trials head on. And I just pray, Lord, that if there be the testing of our faith in this time, that we wouldn't shift the blame to you. But we would see that when life gets hard, it's a chance for us to persevere. That while in the trial we might ask you faithfully and unshakably for wisdom, which we know you will provide, that, can, that we can finally see this greater perspective one that ultimately just points to you and not to our temporary circumstances. Lord, how great it is that you never leave our side. Even if we're the ones who just keep ignoring you, who keep running away, who just ignore and avoid your goodness at all costs. Lord, we welcome your spirit. We welcome your will and your power to do the things that we might not understand in this life, but we know that by your grace that we might stand in your glorious presence someday and see that it was just worth it in the end. But until that time, Lord, send us out. Bless us. 
Stretch us, Heavenly Father. Interrupt our lives to remind us that you have created us and called us to be joyful when life gets hard. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, next week, Pastor Dave's going to come back and he's going to continue this Lockdown Lesson series. I just want to wish you a happy, a safe, and a blessed uh, Memorial Day weekend, and I can't wait to see you again very soon. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today at our online campus. Hope you enjoyed today's service. I'll stick around in the chat if you have any questions or prayer requests. Also, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about anything related to the chapel, and I look forward to seeing you guys next week.